Today we're going to host a webinar on some international finance. Um, we have our good friends from First National Bank, Karen and John, on the line as well. Um, but before we get to their presentation and um, you know who you guys are here to see, um, I will give a quick uh, plug about Scarborough. Um, this is brought to you by Scarborough University. Uh, Scarborough University was founded in 2006 in order to provide additional training to our staff and the trade community as a whole. We have uh, been starting here in the last year or so to do webinars every month, um, as well as a couple of seminars a year. Um, SCARU is also available to come in-house for any of you who have in-house training needs or would like something along those lines. Um, like I said, my name's Adam Hill. I'm the Vice President of Operations here at Scarborough. Um, Scarborough is a group of five companies, and those companies service uh, the international trade community as a whole from international freight forwarding and customs brokerage to warehousing uh, to some of our own asset based trucks and some of uh, some of our own warehouses as well. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Karen and John to get us going. Um, please uh, ask questions. There's a, there's a Q&A feature. Um, on the um, webinar that you're currently on. So please ask them and as they come in, um, I will kind of keep them until the presentation uh, portion of this is over and we kind of open into the Q&A session to be about the last half of this. We will attempt to end right on time in order to uh, be respectful to everyone's schedule. So Karen, John, please take it away. Ooh, we might be having Adam, some. Can you hear me? Okay. There we go. How's this now? Better. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Karen Pinkall, and I'm joined with John Mack and Pinlack in our group here. We're going to. Um, we have quite a few slides, so we're going to go through them quickly and talk about payment terms and um, foreign exchange. Um, we'll go through them quickly, but then we want to make sure we allow a lot of time for questions at the end. Um, now I have to get the PowerPoint to work. There we go. Okay, so when we start talking to customers about payment terms and when they're dealing in foreign countries, things you need to think about are country risk. So things such as the current stability of that country. Are there any sanctions or embargoes? Does the country appear on any um, OFAC or SDN lists? And is that country a place where you might see a lot of fraud? In addition, you want to take a look at the customer risk. Is it a legitimate customer? Are you able to find information? Can you Google them um, and find out that they have a, a good looking website? It makes sense. Are they financially sound? Once you start doing business with these companies um, and start looking to do business with them, you want to make sure that you've asked for financials if you can get them, ask for credit reports or trade references. Um, you can work with groups such as the Department of Commerce um, and other export agencies to help get those references. You also want to make sure that not only the country, but your customer does not appear on any OFAC or biz list, biz standing for the Bureau of Industry and Security. And I think the most important thing overall is to develop a good relationship with your customer overseas. Um, that relationship is very important as things arise down the road and you continue to grow. And then if you're using trade products such as letters of credit and documentary collection, it's important to know what the foreign bank risk is. The size, stability, integrity, again, is the bank on any of these lists? Is it a bank that you're not allowed to do business with um, due to U.S. sanctions? So the four main methods of payment for trade transactions are cash in advance, open account, documentary collections, and letters of credit. Obviously, cash in advance um, is the preferred way to do business internationally. Uh, the perfect way is to just get all of your money up front and then ship your goods. Um, it's the most secure. The buyer really needs to trust that the seller will make the shipment for the item first. On the other extreme, we have open account, meaning the buyer doesn't pay for the goods until a specified date after shipment. It's the best form of payment for the buyer, but the seller needs to put a lot of trust that the buyer will, will make the payment after goods have been received. 
payment isn't made, there is the big problem of collecting the payment in a foreign country if you don't receive that payment when you're supposed to. So those are the two extremes, cash in advance and open account. So next we're going to talk about what's in the middle. So um, first we'll talk about documentary collections. These also are known, we, we see all kinds of names for them, whether they're site drafts or time drafts, DP meaning documents against payment, documents against acceptance, cash against documents. So if you see any of those terms, what they're talking about is a documentary collection. What happens is goods are shipped, the seller presents the shipping documents to their bank, and the seller presents, the, uh, the bank presents the documents to the buyer's bank for payment. I have in green here that you want to make sure it's your international bank, meaning that you're working with a bank that has an international department and knows all the rules and regulations that surround documentary collections. So in this case, banks only facilitate the transaction. They're under no obligation for any payment. It's not a credit product like we're going to talk about. On a site payment, there are ways to help ensure that the buyer doesn't receive the goods until payment is made. You need, want to make sure all, all the documents, including the controlling docs, such as a bill of lading, an original invoice, all flow through the banking channels and nothing gets sent to the customer. Um, one small step above open account, um, because the customer has your documents, they sign something saying that they will pay at a later date, but if they are unable to pay, the bank really doesn't have much control to go after that customer. So again, bank, banks are only going to facilitate the transaction. They're under no obligation. So if you are the seller or exporter, what are the advantages? You keep some control over the documents. You keep the documents and have them flow through the banking channels so your customer cannot get those goods until they pay for those documents, meaning they need to go get those documents in order to get the goods cleared through customs. What are some disadvantages to the exporter? You're shipping the goods without an unconditional promise to pay, so, so your customer could change their mind, and the goods are sitting in a foreign port. If they do decide to not pay or not to collect, then your goods are sitting somewhere else. So the advantages for the buyer, they get to defer the payment until the goods have arrived. So the documents might flow through the bank, and they get to the bank in the foreign country. The foreign bank is going to tell them that the documents are here, and they might let that sit for a week or two until they know that the vessel has arrived and um, the goods are have made it to um, their destination. When would you not use the collection? Maybe for a first-time buyer in a volatile country, bank um, not with a reputable bank, one that doesn't have an international department, and um, probably not for large dollar amounts. When would you, it's a step down from cash in advance or a letter of credit. Maybe if it's someone you've done business with for a long time, it's a distributor, and in some of your more favorable countries and banks. Next we'll touch on a letter of credit. A letter of credit is an undertaking issued by a bank for the account of a buyer or applicant to pay the benefit, provided that the terms and conditions of the LC are complied with. I think the most important part in this sentence is provided that the terms and conditions of an LC are complied with. If you do everything you're supposed to do under a letter of credit, payment is guaranteed. So that is the key point there. So letters of credit, also known as an LC or an, an, L, or an LOC, are issued for all kinds of reasons. Maybe if the exporter feels insecure with the buyer and his ability to pay. Maybe the buyer wants it so they can finance against it. Um, and in some countries, they control movement of funds with letters of credit or trade finance products. And in some parts or industries, that might just be the way a standard way of doing business. So what happens? Well, when a bank issues a letter of credit, it's like a contract between the issuing bank and the beneficiary. The bank must honor and pay if the terms and conditions of the LC are met. The seller's no longer looking to the buyer for payment, but to the buyer's bank. But to make it binding, again, as I mentioned, all terms and conditions of the letter of credit need to be complied with. If they're not complied with, the bank is no longer on the hook for payment, and they're going to contact the buyer to approve it. So in this case, if it's discrepant, the letter of credit kind of turns into a documentary collection, meaning the bank is not on the hook for payment anymore. What are the advantages to the seller or the exporter? It provides an independent credit backing with a clear-cut promise to pay. Instead of looking to your customer, you're looking to your customer's bank, and you might be able to find more information on your customer's bank credit ratings that you can get comfortable with. Payment is assured if the terms of the LC are met with, and it also can help protect from court order cancellation. 
If you have a specific um, item and you want to make sure that if it gets overseas, no one can change their mind, a letter of credit is a good way um, to do business. Um, the advantages for the buyer or the importer, it assures that shipment was made according to the terms of the letter of credit and it is on time. You know, assure that the documents requesting the LC are provided and payment is not made until goods are shipped and compliant documents are presented or the buyer approves the discrepancies. I always like to give a good example here. We have a customer that was importing some goods for a specific Broncos game. Um, they tried themselves or shipment. They were concerned about shipment time. So they needed to know that their, in this case, hats with a specific Broncos date on them would get here in time and if they didn't they didn't want to have to pay for them so they ended up using a letter of credit so if those goods would have been late shipped they wouldn't have been on the hook to make payment so that was one example that one of our customers had used in the past so we kind of looked at there are three contracts or three independent contracts to a letter of credit the buyer and seller come to terms to buy or sell us some goods the buyer goes to their bank and fills out a letter of credit, letter of credit application so in that part of the second contract you could call it the buyer and the issuing bank have some kind of relationship after the issuing bank issues a letter of credit it goes directly to the seller meaning it's just between the issuing bank and the seller and if the seller performs under the letter of credit the issuing bank must pay regardless of what at that point has happened with the buyer so there's two types of letters of credit there's commercial letters that in standby a commercial credit is a sales transaction taking place so someone's importing and someone is exporting there's typically a shipment that has taken place a standby letter of credit is used if there's a chance of default so an example might be a bid or performance bond back lease and payments guarantee loan repayments um, we see these predominantly more domestically than we do in the uh, international realm. Most of the L standby LCs we issue are for domestic reasons, but they follow the same rules and regulations as commercial LCs, so they are housed typically in a global banking department. I think I mentioned most of that already. So here's a nice chart that just shows the, the, the risk from uh, minimum to maximum risk for the seller. Obviously, the best way, we always tell people, if you get cash in advance, that's great. Um, then next, if you're moving up, up the chain for risk, is would be confirmed or unconfirmed letters of credit, site collection, factoring, forfeiting, uh, documents against payment, uh, against acceptance, and then obviously open account. But that's a nice little chart that our customers like to have to refer to. So here's just a quick list of common documents you might see to a letter of credit. You know, a nice letter of credit might have three or four documents, but we see some that give a lot more than that. So that is a quick wrap up of um, international payment terms. Next, I'll turn it over to John McApinlack and he can talk a little about foreign exchange. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, one of the key challenges for foreign exchange marketers when dealing with corporates is uh, the challenges of explaining the value of dealing in current in the US dollar. So on the first slide here, uh, why deal in foreign exchange? If you're, uh, if you're actively managing your receivables and selling overseas, exporting overseas, it could create better margins for you because you're mitigating the risk and exposure associated with those receivables. Uh, one thing customers tend to do, especially in a volatile market, is, is hedge a portion of their anticipated sales and then add on as needed or adjust as needed to mirror their sales uh, for the next few quarters. Uh, on the import side, actively managing payables can lead to better cost savings. So uh, one thing that we try to tell customers to do is request dual currency invoicing. When I say dual currency invoicing, what that typically means is going up to your vendor and asking them to quote you in both U.S. dollars what that does is enables you to essentially back into what their price is and determine whether or not it's more advantageous for you to uh, pay them in US dollars or in foreign currency. Uh, another thing to consider is the pricing flexibility. So what you take when you are able to sell in foreign currency, it enables your overseas clients to compare apples to apples in pricing. Uh, so, you know, how many units of, uh, of the product you're selling equates to their currency. Uh, you're also able to compete against 
the local presence. So if they're dealing locally and they're a large company, obviously they're going to be probably be dealing in, in the local currency. So this helps you compete in that regards. And it also helps you compete with in-country competitors. So besides the U.S. multinationals, uh, competitors that are in-country are obviously invoicing in their local currency. So that assists your clients uh, in better determining pricing. But there are countries that only deal in dollars due to the restrictions, such as China, uh, Korea. Uh, so those countries are out there as well. A little bit of an overview of the foreign exchange market. It is the largest decentralized asset class. Trillions of dollars worth of currency are traded daily. Uh, serves four primary functions, investments, hedging, and speculative purposes. It could be also be traded over the counter, which is the bulk of what your foreign exchange is. Uh, over-the-counter meeting with your banks or your non-bank providers or via the exchanges such as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. What are some of the factors that move the market? And uh, we'll be touching on some of this in a little bit, but uh, obviously economic news drives the market, uh, the release of lower than expected gross domestic product numbers or trade numbers can affect the currency markets instantaneously. Uh, central bank intervention is also a key factor. Uh, movements by the Fed, European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan can move the markets. Uh, market sentiment and rumors. Uh, politics, obviously that's a big factor uh, from last night's uh, election that we'll discuss later. Funds coming into the U.S. makes the dollar stronger. And then technical analysis as a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's more for the, for the traders uh, because essentially they look at historical rates and may place their positions based on where they see historical rates going. What is currency risk? So unexpected changes in the exchange rate, well, those are the risks that it'll increase your costs, reduce your profit margins, create inconsistencies in your balance sheet, or create FX gains or losses on your income statement. And there are several products to, uh, to look at for that, but uh, real quick here, I wanted to share uh, with everybody some of the current movements in the currency market uh, on a year over year basis. 21% drop in the British pound, so lots of volatility there. Euro, uh, close to a 9% change in the currency in one year. Uh, Mexican peso is a fairly huge mover, 21% approximately. And the Canadian dollar is another large mover based on commodity levels, uh, down 14% year over year. Some of the basic products that are out there for the foreign currency uh, traders are the spot contract, which is essentially just a, a standard purchase for sale of currency to settle within one or two business days. Uh, settle between one or two business days just simply because of uh, time differences from one uh, time zone to another. Uh, so for example, for Canadian dollars and Mexican pesos, they settle at one business days, meaning uh, if, we, if you do a deal with your bank, they debit you and then your beneficiary receives payment the next day. Uh, other countries such as the Eurozone or Japan, they get uh, credited within two business days due to time zone differences again. So that's your most basic transaction. The other transaction that's most basic, uh, prominently used are the forward contracts. What forward contracts are designed to do is lock in on exposure that settle uh, past spot. So anything future dated, whether it's uh, receivable or payable that you want to lock in exposure and certainty, you can lock in on what's called the forward contract. And this kind of summarizes essentially what I've mentioned, but uh, it is available in most currencies and customizable maturity dates. So uh, if you have invoice that's dated for a specific date or you have receivables with terms, you can essentially match your contract to mirror those particular invoices or um, contracts. And uh, finally, the relationship between the spot and forward market is based on interest rate parity. So it makes you immune, essentially, from holding one currency over another. So there's an adjustment made when you lock in on a forward. And as I just mentioned, uh, forward contracts can be a fixed date, meaning they're, they can settle at an exact date to match a payable or receivable, or they can settle within a window of dates. Typically, uh, 30 days is most 
commonly used, but you can go as long as 90 days, depending on the financial institution we're working with. What this window forward is enable, enables you to do is essentially uh, settle up on your contract within a period of dates as opposed to one, one specific date. So it's a lot more flexible to use. Some internal considerations when dealing in foreign exchange is consider your overall corporate exposure and opportunities, meaning do a self-assessment on where you're selling into and where your opportunities arise uh, with com versus competitors or potential customers. Uh, what we recommend is uh, from a best practices perspective is devise an internal risk management policy on your exposures. Uh, what hedging tools are you gonna be utilizing? What department internally is responsible for the function? And how do you measure a successful policy? Meaning at the end of each hedging period, has your hedge been successful to what your goals are as a corporation? And again, for importers, ask about invoicing in local currency versus dollars. Utilize dual currency invoicing when appropriate so that you can determine whether or not it's more advantageous for you to pay in local currency versus US dollars. And with that, uh, I guess we leave it up to, to uh, the Q&A portion of our presentation. So, Adam? Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, you know, there, there's definitely some good information out there. And I think um, I know we have questions coming in as we speak. I've written a few down myself. Um, one of the things that you just mentioned um, is that you talk about companies creating risk management strategies or risk management um, groups or policies and, and, and on this call, you know, we have fortune 500 companies down to small mom and pop shops. So I understand that as companies grow, you know, they have risk managers that have these departments. Well, how do some of the smaller businesses take and, you know, take this into account? Because obviously I understand very much that, you know, I deal with people all over the world and I pay in multiple currencies and we take an active approach in kind of trying to manage that process. But how do smaller companies, you know, someone that's buying, you know, someone that might have 10 employees, how do they manage this process and what kind of best practices have you seen some of those smaller companies do that kind of give them some of the same bang for their buck that you get from these larger corporations who, who have, risk managers and those types of either departments and or policies already in place? Right, absolutely. Great question. Um, so with the smaller end of the spectrum, it's imperative to find a banking partner or a non-bank provider that is willing to walk that particular business through the entire process. So understanding the markets, understanding levels, understanding pricing is imperative in order to determine what's best to utilize. Uh, for the smaller companies, uh, when they're utilizing hedging vehicles, the most common, as I mentioned previously, uh, tool that you can utilize is a forward contract. And what that does is provide economic certainty on the, on the exposure and leaves them as a small business with the opportunity or the, the prospects of locking in the risk and focusing in on what they're good at, which is selling their product or marketing their product. So utilizing a, a, a hedging tool such as a forward contract, again, which is the most basic means of locking in exposure is imperative in that situation. Another best practice that we like to tout is being able to utilize uh, uh, a means to uh, internally lock in the exchange rates and then confirming it. So using um, a means of security internally. So make sure that you uh, have one person possibly do the deal and another person internally uh, confirm it is a good way to protect yourself as a company so that you don't have fraudsters out there trying to do deals on your behalf without you knowing. So if you have some type of internal um, way of checks and balances, that's another key thing to look at as a small business as well. So I think my kind of takeaway from that is that find a partner that will help you through this, you know, because obviously it's a win for everyone. If you're doing business internationally, it's a win for you as an exporter and growing your product base. And it's also a win for your bank who's the partner because you know they can help in that transaction as well. So it sounds like maybe that is you know the big takeaway there. Is that is that a correct statement? Yeah, I, I would believe so. Okay. So yes, just definitely finding a, a good partner to work with that can walk you through the process is imperative and key for a small business. 
Thank you. Um, just real quick, um, someone just asked a question, can we have a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes, that will go out um, at the very end of this. We are also recording this, so we um, will get this posted out on Scarborough's YouTube channel um, for anyone else who wants to be able to view this. Um, this question and answer period will actually also be broken down into snippets so people can go ahead and if you're just looking for an answer to a specific question rather than watching the whole hour long, just watch the couple of minutes. Um, the next question, um, you know, we're also getting a lot of questions that I want to brace you guys for because they're asking for your opinion. And I know that you can't uh, predict the future or else we probably wouldn't be doing what we're doing today. But um, obviously, what are you guys thinking from, from an international perspective? Um, as far as, I mean, I obviously have an opinion on kind of where I think trade may or may not go, but from the foreign exchange side of this, and, you know, I know last night um, with Scarborough having operations in Mexico, I follow the peso very closely. Um, the peso has been directly linked to the election um, and, and kind of where, you know, uh, we thought that whoever was going to win kind of as the peso moved. So, what other factors, you know, can people try to prepare for? Is there anything that in the banking community you guys are seeing or is there anything specific that um, you would like for people to kind of be aware of as, as we move into this transition period from a president-elect Trump to a president Trump in January? You know, what should we expect over this next 60 to 90 days and then obviously going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. And thanks for clarifying that. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a big question mark, uh, especially in the foreign exchange markets. A couple of key, I mean, I, I just jotted down a few key data points to take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the Fed is definitely going to be key. Uh, obviously, there are those that are pricing in the fact that the Fed might not move any longer in December. But there are also those that say maybe they'll move sooner than, you know, make more moves sooner than, than anticipated with the with the President Trump in place. Uh, so with the Fed possibly raising rates in December and then having more increases within a shorter period of time, that'll definitely play in the currency markets and where the dollar moves. Uh, the market moves in favor of the dollar as rates diverge between the US, the Fed, and you know our trading partners. So with the thing you'll see probably a uh, next few months. Uh, other key pieces to take into consideration continue to be economic data. I mean, it's it's generally politics play an, a, a short term role in what's going. Obviously, is where economic data continues to move. Whether or not our jobs data continues to be strong, that'll play a key role in how the Fed moves and where the currencies go, uh, as well as trade data. So. You know, trade data, again, leads to Mr. Trump's, President Trump's uh, legislation or talk about getting rid of our trade agreements, which obviously will play a major role in where the currency market moves. I think in the near term, what you're going to see is, speaking of last night, about peso, it did move 12%. It lost 12% of its value overnight and this morning, but then it leveled off again. So I, I think the closer we get, to the inauguration, the more clarity hopefully we'll see, uh, at least over the course of the next couple months here. The markets took that into account that maybe they oversold their positions overnight. And uh, you see the Dow uh, trending, I think, in positive territory throughout the course of the day, the dollar recovering some of its lost ground. Uh, so that's going to be key is to have some stability going into the inauguration. Uh, obviously, some of what President Trump's uh, uh, goals are to help businesses uh, grow and help jobs uh, here in the U.S., which is obviously positive. For, so, uh, you know, depending on whether or not he can get or agreements, uh, that'll play a key role. Uh, in, sorry, what was that? Oh, no, I'm sorry. You, you uh, broke up there for a second. Sorry to everyone. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty today. I'm not sure uh, where it's coming from, so I do apologize. Um, so if you would actually um, continue, John, I, I, we had had a break there. So, so, so again, I think the Fed movement, uh, when, when they're going to raise rates, 
watching economic data. I mean, these are all known facts. So these are just things to keep in mind over the course of the next few months, uh, whether or not it can get legislation in place to revise or eliminate our trade agreements. Uh, potential easing of banking regulations will obviously pay, play a role in, in what the currency markets are doing and what banks can do from a trade perspective. And also taxation on, on corporates that are dealing overseas. I know that uh, President-elect Trump has touted that as well, taxing U.S.-based companies that do business overseas. Uh, so that could play a key role in growth and stability in the markets. Perfect. Thank you. Um, kind of kind of switch gears here for a minute and, and talk a little bit about credit risk. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in on this. I wrote down a couple of, you know, a couple as well is one of the questions that we just got credit insurance or credit trade insurance. Is it a good tool to reduce risk with the foreign customer or kind of what does that look like um, for somebody? Um. Yeah, I would say it definitely is a great tool. So we don't, banks don't sell that, but there are a lot of insurance agencies, including Exim Bank, that um, will sell export credit insurance. It protects you from your um, open accounts receivables, so maybe your credit folks at your department can sleep a little better at night. Um, and also, if those receivables, foreign receivables are insured, a lot of times your bank is willing to count those in your borrowing base, and thereby lending you some more money. So they are a good tool. There is a cost for them. But if it's something that you think you might be interested in, I definitely recommend you call an insurance company or an insurance broker. Um, brokers are great because they work with all of the insurance companies and they try to find the best one that works for you. Whether you need a single buyer policy for just one customer or you want a multi-buyer um, policy. So it is a definitely a great tool and we do see um, quite a few customers looking to that. So kind of going on, going along those lines is, you know, we, you talked a little bit early in your presentation about, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the spectrum of no risk to lots of risk. And so let's say someone has done something like cash against documents or something along the lines of maybe shipping on an open account and their cargo arrives somewhere and then they don't get paid. What, what recourse do they have? You know, I know there's obviously, you know, what can they find attorneys? Do they go back to their bank? How do they try to, what is the recourse in here or for that shipper to try to collect those funds? So for open account terms, if for non-payment, that is why you might look at credit insurance. That is going to help cover you from some of those risks. If you're doing open account, there's not a lot that the bank can do because you're not using a bank trade product. Um, we mentioned that having a good policy in place for your risk appetite for, from the foreign exchange standpoint, you should always have a, 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 some kind of credit policy in place based on your customers and the length of time you've worked with them, their reputation, for, or references, trade references, financials, as so what type of um, terms you're willing to give them. Maybe you only do letters of credit. Maybe you are willing to do cash in advance. Maybe everything's open account. Um, so we always recommend that you have some kind of for um, the credit side as well. So going along that, so obviously, you know, like here in the U.S., you apply for credit through lots of things. We have customers apply through credit for us, and we obviously run them through a credit check, and, and, and there's firms out there that do that, does the same thing exist internationally? So are there companies, corporations, products that our clients can purchase or at least use and try to get credit reports on those foreign agencies? Because I know that's a little different than it is here in the US, especially when we get into, you know, certain countries have certain privacy laws that we have to deal with and, and things of that nature. Yes, that's true. And so um, insurance brokers not only help to find the right kind of insurance for you, but they're able to help you find credit reports when you need them. Um, and like you mentioned, there's some countries, or just some companies aren't willing to release information. You can also work with the Department of Commerce. They're able to gather some information as well. Um, and then um, again, back to your uh, credit insurance brokers, they, they really 
are helpful when it comes to things like that. And then there are times where you might not get much. And then with those people, maybe you decide to, you, you just don't have a lot of risk you're willing to take. And so, you know, it has to be cash in advance or a letter of credit. And then as you build that relationship with them, maybe you're willing to relax that a little. So, so going actually right along that point, you know, how are there maybe some key indicators? Are there some best practices around when you kind of move someone, you know, up or down that continuum from, you know, right now we're cash in advance to you know, up or right now we're letter of credit, but we want to maybe relax that some. So are there some key indicators or best practices that would tell a company this might be a good or bad decision to do that? I would say that that is totally based on that company's risk appetite. We see customers and companies that get every letter of credit they do confirmed and everything has to be cash in advance or a confirmed letter of credit. Do I think they need to do that? Maybe not, but that's their company's risk appetite. They're, they're very conservative. And then we also work with some that have kind of more that tiered approach. But it's working with the credit risk group in that company as well as, you know, the chief financial officer or controller that's willing to um, kind of take it to that next step. I wish I had an answer, but it seems like in our experience, everyone's a little different with, with their risk. So, no, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, everyone does obviously have their own risk appetite in, in places they're willing to make a bet or not. Um, with that, you know, how does the payment terms and then, you know, they can obviously pull in the INCO terms or the, you know, how do those kind of tie together or, or is there any correlation or, or can they kind of be somewhat separate? So, yeah, the INCO, to, INCO terms help with um, who's going to maybe carry insurance, who's going to move the freight, who's responsible for those items. So definitely having the right INCO term. Um, is important when you're making the sale. It's not law, but it's a way of internationally way accepted way of putting the right INCO terms with the year. Obviously, the newest one is 2010 after it. So by quoting the right INCO terms and, and having your both parties agree to that, that does give some guidance on who's responsible for what, but it, it's not law and it's not going to you know, guarantee payment or something like that. It's just, it helps guide the transaction along the way for risk and responsibility. Gotcha. Um, you had mentioned it in your presentation, um, the, the story about the Denver Broncos hats. Um, I think a lot of people, I think it's probably a, a myth out there that says, you know, in the textile world, letters of credits are a little bit more common on cargo moving into the United States, but most people assume this is a product or an offering only for people shipping cargo out of the United States. So how does that work on the inbound side? Because I don't think that's a lot of things people think of about drop dead dates and things like that, that, that those dates are so critical and what kind of protection can they afford themselves? Can you walk a little bit through that? Sure. So on the import side, it's kind of, you know, when I talk about the advantages for the exporter, you kind of, you know, turn your hat around and it's the same way for the import. So you're able to show your customer overseas that you can go to your bank and get a letter of credit right then and there you've shown that you're a credit worthy customer. The foreign customer might be more willing to do business with you because now instead of looking to you, they're looking to their, to your bank for payment on that. They are, able to um, produce the documents and submit them through the bank and they know that they're guaranteed payment. So it's kind of the things you might think of on the export side, which is where you're right, we usually go to first. But you know, if you customers side or the importer side, we certainly have a lot of importers here in the United States that bring goods in and use letters of credit for those as well. And so in that case, if you're the importer, you're the one going to your bank to have the letter of credit issued. So it become a credit product at your bank in that case. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I think that's something that I, I, like I said, I think there's a lot of importers here in the United States that don't really think through that, that they could have this as well. And, and there could potentially be some benefit to them um, besides just a cost of doing the letter of credit with 
with their bank for whoever they're kind of going through to get that process worked through. Yep, I agree. Um, so um, kind of switching gears again, I'm kind of trying to keep the questions at, at least in chunks so we're not switching back and forth all the time, but we have a question here. We have sister plants that we purchase components which are located in France, Thailand, Japan, and China, uh, to name a few. Uh, they would like to understand about planning and forecasting for those foreign exchange rates and, and that effect. And I think John has maybe hits on some of the hedging in you know the forward contracts. And then once you kind of maybe hit on that, I, I do have a follow up on the forward contracts question. Sure. So forecasting is obviously an inexact science. Uh, they change quarter by quarter and can be fairly inaccurate unless you're dealing with the Hong Kong dollar, which is pegged to the U.S. dollar. So it hardly ever moves. Um, so yeah, forecasting uh, as it pertains to utilizing uh, economic forecasts are probably not the way to go when you're talking about forecasting future payables or intercompany movements of funds. Um, what we try to tell customers to utilize is to utilize, their, again, their banking partners and getting an approximate forward rate of what, to mirror where their potential payables or receivables are. That way you can get a better idea of, okay, I'm going to lock in on my margins. I just want to know what the forward points are going to be for each period. My intercompany movements of funds, can you give me that level for each quarter? So I think that's a better way of utilizing forecasts is to at least getting an idea of what you're locking in on the margin side so that you can get uh, what the hedge would cost for each period. And I think that's a better indicator of where you can, where you can forecast internally versus utilizing uh, market forecasts from 20 different banks or 20 different providers. Because at least you're locking in on your margins and utilizing current rates to mirror what your future cash flows are as opposed to forecast that it could be, you know, everywhere. Right. Um, with, when you're dealing in a company, like this particular question suggests, uh, with the cash flows from different sister companies, a lot of uh, banks sell what are called netting platforms, so intercompany netting. So if you have cash flows that go from sister company to sister company where you have 10 companies selling to each other, all affiliated with the same headquarters or institution, a netting program could be the way to go. And what that enables you to do is essentially uh, com exchange currencies in the, in the base or the quarter standpoint where you can lock in on exposures by each company and netting it to its base currency. So whatever the notional currency is for the headquarters is what you can manage towards. So inquire about that if you have several sister companies that have intermediary cash or inter intercompany cash flows, a netting program might be the way to go for you. And it could be a good practice as a corporate entity. So, it, it, so one of the things you brought up about uh, forward contracts and, and a question that kind of popped in into my head um, so from, from the exporter side of this, do my customers like this? Is this something that, that's a common thing for them to see? Is this something that maybe I can only push through with some of my best customers? Or um, kind of walk through what you've seen as, as far as that goes, because obviously I see the, the advantages of it, but if my customer's not a big fan of it, you know, do, do a lot of foreign customers expect that? Is, is that something that they see often? Well, it, if it's if it's a company or a customer that resides in the country that's affected by the strength of the U.S. dollar, it's obviously more expensive for them to convert to U.S. dollars when they're dealing in their base currency. So you're relying on them. If you're exporting and you're pricing them in U.S. dollars, you're relying on them to hedge on their end and convert their currency to U.S. dollars and take the risk and exposure on their end. Uh, so those countries that are experiencing the brunt of the U.S. dollar strength, such as the Canadian dollar, uh, Mexican peso, the euro, uh, those types of countries, uh, they should be more open to looking at having you invoice them in their local currency so that they're able to quantify the cost of their bank from you. And it enables you as an exporter to be more competitive, like I mentioned earlier because you're competing against potential international companies that are domiciled in the U.S. that are willing to invoice in foreign currency, or you're dealing against uh, in-country competitors 
like a, you know, a Canadian manufacturer that sells the exact same type of product that can price it at a more competitive price because they're dealing in local currency terms. So yeah, those, those, uh, those countries that are being hurt by the dollar on the conversion side should be willing to do it. And it's, it's becoming more prevalent, especially uh, from Mexico and Canada. So speaking of, of the strength of, of the dollar, I know this is something that I personally get, get confused often and, and have to think about it for a second. When you say the U.S. dollar is strong, is it, is it that it's buying more of that foreign currency? So one dollar of U.S. currency equals more Canadian currency or does one, one U.S. dollar equal less Canadian currency when you say that, that the dollar is strong? When the dollar is strong, it takes more of the foreign currency to convert to U.S. dollars. So it becomes mm -hmm. more expensive for the buyer. Right. Okay. No, no, absolutely. I just wanted to make sure I, it's a very common thing that, that we hear a lot. You hear people on the news or, or, or anywhere talk about, well, the dollar's strong. Well, a lot of people don't, I don't think, equate what the dollar is strong. What does that actually mean? So... Um, here, here, another question that is coming in is, you know, what is the best, best method to reduce risk between currency and changing currency exchange rates? Well, as I mentioned previously, I think the most basic and probably best hedging technique is to utilize a forward contract. Simply utilizing a forward is, is the most simple because you're able to quantify the exposure right off the bat and lock in your margins or your cost of product. So it, it's, it's the easiest way to hedge, uh, the least accounting friendly. Now there are customers that obviously look at option structures, which can give customers the ability to have unlimited upside or limited upside if you use structured options just as a range forward or a, a collar of some kind. But uh, if you're a publicly traded company to use fast FAS rules, uh, it's a lot harder to measure those. And if you're a middle, middle market or mid-sized company to a small business, it's a lot harder to work with options uh, component once the contract matures or settles. And plus, with an option structure, especially when you're dealing with vanilla uh, puts and calls, it can be fairly pricey because you have an upfront premium to pay for uh, with the, for the potential upside. Uh, on your exposure. So again, a forward contract is probably the most basic and best way to lock in exposure. And it locks in your margins, uh, locks in your payables. So you know upfront what the cost is, payable or receivable structure internally. So kind of going off of that, I've got a couple of questions coming in that, that talk about can, is there a place, do you guys have a product? Are there places people can go to kind of learn more about this? Because obviously if you type this into Google or something, you're going to get a massive number of searches, some legit, some not legit. Um, I'm assuming you guys might have some documentation. Where's a good place for our clients to go or refer, you know, their, their customers or places that to go to, to understand this a, a little bit more? Well, again, I think, I think both sides, both on the exchange side and then as well as just letters of credit and things of, of that nature. Okay, well, again, I think going through their banks, uh, their primary banking institutions uh, is probably the main way to learn about the basics on the foreign exchange market. If their bank doesn't have an international department, they likely find it that has the product that you know, they utilize to sell through. Um, so going to the bank first is probably the best way to do it. There are non-bank providers out there as well, whose primary purpose is to sell foreign exchange. Uh, so they can have some institutions as well. Um, but again, I think primarily working through their banks, their primary banks is the way to get a better understanding of the products that are out there and what uh, foreign exchange platforms are most suitable. And on the trade side, can you probably speak to that as well? Sure, so similar to what John said, I think working through your um, bank provider that has an international department. So for example, we work closely with our importers and exporters that are both new to 
international trade and those who have done it for a long time but just have questions that come up. We also do um, in-house training and uh, partner with groups such as this one and to do uh, workshops and webinars and um, we do some regional training as well as it comes up. But usually the bank that you're working with um, should be willing to take the time to educate you on these products. So that's really where you can stop or you, where you can start. Also, another great place for trade products is export.gov. It's the Department of Commerce website, and as far as government websites go, I think it's um, very useful. It has a lot of information that goes um, pretty in-depth into different trade products that are out there, so I recommend people visit that site as well. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, it, so, um, you know, I, like, all of our webinars are and, and our upcoming events are, are posted. Um, are your guys that way the same? So people can either go to your website or, or find that, that information? So usually when we do a webinar or workshop, we're partnering with um, other organizations. So those are housed there, such as the Scarborough one, or we work with um, the Department of Commerce or the Small Business Development Centers or different chambers of commerce. So they usually are coming out of those, those groups. Okay. We do let, let them send those out as requested perfect um you know going uh, i just got another question here um the first one is what is the purpose of ofac and then how does ofac and you know the follow-up behind this how does ofac influence foreign transaction and does the ofac also influence foreign exchange so um ofac is the office of foreign assets control it's a it's a regulation it's U.S. law. Um, it's a list of all of the specially designated nationals. Um, anything that the United States government is putting sanctions or restrictions on will show up on these lists. So, you know, Cuba, Iran, Syria, the, the countries show up. Any businesses in those countries, um, terrorists, anyone tied to money laundering, the list has thousands and thousands and I mean, it's well over 10,000 names on it. So um, every bank is required to um, run everything they do through OFAC. So we all subscribe to different um, providers or vendors that offer solutions for us to do this. And it's not just from an international standpoint, it's from a domestic one as well. So from a banking regulation standpoint, we are required to send everything through hit up against the what we just internally call the OFAC list, which actually is several lists. Um, if you want to read more about it, you can go to the um, U.S. Treasury website and you'll know more than you ever wanted to know about it. But it's not just to banks. It's re um, one dealing internationally is required to um, uh, abide by these regulations. So you can't just look to your bank to list check these for you because by the time, you know, your bank gets involved, these goods might have already set sail and it might be too late. So we list checking them all the time. I mean, with a letter of credit from the time we get it, we check it. When we get the documents, we check it. And when we get paid, we check it in the whole life cycle of that transaction. But it is a U.S. regulation that is required for all, all banks. And um, it also contains uh, ports, vessel names, maybe if, you know, if it's an Iranian flag vessel. Now, of course, that vessel would have a hard time calling to port in the United States, but maybe you're shipping from one, one country to another country and it's not coming to the United States. So all of that needs to be checked. And I wouldn't say that that list would be tied to the foreign currency market as well. It's just, it's a, just a banking, banking and trade regulation. So to kind of carry that on, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, obviously, Scarborough as a freight forwarder as many freight forwarders do and hopefully they all do is that you know We also checking in um, it, it's common a lot of people here at call um, here at called maybe the denied parties list or something along that and there it's kind of one name for a much larger subset of names in different uh, Groups within the government that that don't allow or put restrictions on some of that trade um, and I think something that, that that's interesting for our, our clients to understand and you kind of hit hit on it is, is the fact that you as a US company are required to follow US export law even if that cargo is not leaving directly from the United States but if you're involved in, the, in that transaction 
Um, a good example of that is that Scarborough with Scarborough de Mexico, um, we have our own fully operating Mexican entity. Um, according to U.S. law, that Mexican entity follows the same rules and regulations um, because of our ownership structure in that, that it's owned by a U.S. company that it would be as Scarborough International were shipping that product as well. And I just wanted to make sure that, you know, those of you on the call kind of um, understand some of that and, and make sure that you're aware that if you're drop shipping something directly from your supplier in Mexico to somewhere else is that you still have some liability inside of that transaction that you do need to be aware of. Yep. So we have about four more minutes here. We have a couple of more questions left. If anyone has any last minute questions, get them in. If for whatever reason we aren't able to answer them here, um, we will make sure that um, we get them to Karen and John and we get them answered. And then once that's done, we'll, we will get them sent out to everyone. Um, the, the next um, crystal ball question is, how, will, how is Brexit going to affect the EU? And then on top of that, the Euro. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Brexit, it's essentially the UK referendum that occurred back in uh, June 23rd at the behest of uh, Prime Minister David Cameron at the time, to see whether or not the United Kingdom is willing to leave the European Union would they've been a part of for uh, decades. Um, and obviously the, the vote on June 23rd occurred and it was to leave the union, which uh, many people after the, 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 the referendum were bad about. Um, so what that did was cause the British pound to lose double digit uh, value against the US dollars. It, it now currently trades between 123 to 125 per dollar. Uh, so what that, uh, what the Brexit vote signifies is essentially uh, by March of 2017, as long as Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty is invoked, there's a two-year process for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union, and that's with the backing of Parliament. Um, so Theresa May, the new Prime Minister there, is in charge of doing all of that. Uh, and what this basically will do is uh, it, it kind of opens the door. I mean, I'm prognosticating here, but it does open the door for other European Union members possibly leave. Obviously, a few years ago, you had Greece potentially wanting to leave. And uh, actually, many countries in the European Union were asking them to leave, but they're still there. Um, and it also caused, you know, other indebted countries such as Spain, Italy, uh, Ireland to reconsider leaving the union as well. So it opens the door for that. So there is some concern about the potential breakup of the European Union and what will it will how it will affect uh, the eurozone. Um, obviously, Germany has a, a very concern, a big interest in what happens here, and whether or not this will be an orderly uh, leaving of the UK. So uh, that's so definitely something to take a look at over the course of 2017. Uh, and potentially more members leaving cause the euro to destabilize further and weaken further against the U.S. dollar. So at this point, you know, markets are fairly stable considering what happened last night uh, with the British pound trading back to within its recent ranges. But uh, March 2017, that, that uh, invocation of that article goes into place. Within two years, the U.K. will be out of the European Union. Perfect. Thank you. Well, um, I'm looking at my phone here and it looks like we have kind of butted right up to time. I, I saw a question here coming at the very end. Um, I will get you the, the answer um, as soon as we are off air. I wanted to thank um, Karen and John again for participating um, during this. Like I said, uh, a copy of this will be posted and sent to everyone along with the recording of the webinar itself. So with that, uh, please look for um, some news on our next webinars um, and seminars uh, coming up soon. So thanks, everyone.